and welcome to Picture This, a podcast from the photo archives of the Albuquerque Museum. My name is Jill Hartke, and I'm the digital archivist here at the museum. Today we learn how a farmer's son from Ohio became one of New Mexico's most outspoken and influential politicians. In the photo archives of the Albuquerque Museum is a photograph showing Clyde and Carrie Tingley standing outside a house in Albuquerque around 1912. Here's the story behind the photograph. Clyde Tingley was born in the early 1880s on a farm in London, Ohio. He was one of seven brothers and worked on the farm until he was 19, when he left to become a member of a railroad construction crew and fireman. He moved to Dayton, Ohio in 1904 to work as a drill press mechanic at the National Cash Register Company, helping to build cash registers like this one that was used in Harvey houses around the country. By 1908, he had moved to Bowling Green, Ohio, and found work as a shopman at a motor company. It was in Bowling Green where he met Carrie Wooster. Carrie was the only child of a wealthy couple who lived in a large house on a street that still bears the Wooster name. Carrie's father died of tuberculosis, and Carrie contracted the illness. She needed a change in climate. So in 1910, Carrie and her mother boarded a westbound train. History is divided on whether Clyde Tingley was on that train escorting the two women or whether he joined them later. But nevertheless, they got as far as Albuquerque before they needed a doctor. The doctor, seeing how sick Carrie was, advised them to stay in town. So they did. They found a small house on East Cromwell in the sand hills of Albuquerque. And Clyde drove Carrie to her doctor appointments as she recovered from tuberculosis. In April of 1911, Carrie and Clyde were married. Among his friends and family in Ohio, Clyde was known as a hard worker with an aggressive personality. Nobody considered him a good candidate for public office. But in Albuquerque, now the husband of a very wealthy woman, he had little reason to take up the blue-collar work he was used to. He didn't need money. He needed purpose. His work ethic and aggressive character demanded an outlet. And in New Mexico, he found it in politics. Tingley's first political office was as alderman in 1916. He would drive around the neighborhood looking for problems he could fix. He was next elected to the city commission and then appointed chairman of the city commission, a title which he shortened to mayor. He served for over a decade as mayor of Albuquerque, building alliances and dreams into his reality. He and Carrie had no children, and they took on Albuquerque as their sole responsibility. Clyde hooked up utilities and paved roads, and Carrie visited the sick and brought presents for the children. They routinely went to the railroad depot to welcome arriving celebrities and travelers. And in the evenings, they would drive around to check on things, essentially putting their baby to bed. Clyde loved the spotlight and the notoriety that came with public office. He especially loved rubbing elbows with celebrities. In the late 1920s, he became unlikely friends with Franklin Delano Roosevelt when Roosevelt visited New Mexico for the treatment of his polio. The two had vastly different upbringings, but each knew the political world. And they both had wealthy wives who steered their husbands' political careers from the background. Clyde also counted among his friends two of Hollywood's biggest stars, Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. Douglas Fairbanks campaigned for Clyde when he ran for governor in 1934, comparing Tingley to a Kansas cyclone and describing him as an outspoken man of action who had worked tirelessly to build up Albuquerque. That campaign, like most of Tingley's campaigns, was a bitter one, full of mudslinging and insults. But he won. As governor, Clyde's celebrity friendships benefited New Mexico. When President Roosevelt's New Deal money was being allocated to states, Clyde Tingley landed a very large portion of funding for New Mexico. Much of the money was used to continue to build up Clyde's baby. Albuquerque saw huge growth in federally funded projects, including buildings at the University of New Mexico, the turning of a garbage dump along the Rio Grande into a swimming beach, the creation of the zoo, the building of the New Mexico State Fairgrounds, and a large park designed to honor Tingley's friend in high places, Roosevelt Park. 
Along with Clyde's projects, he convinced Roosevelt to fund the building of a children's hospital for polio patients in southern New Mexico. And the townspeople of Hot Springs, now Truth or Consequences, named it after Carrie. Despite his carefully cultivated friendships, Clyde Tingley made enemies. His bombastic nature was off-putting for many fellow politicians who saw him as uneducated, loud, and difficult. But the public saw him as relatable and down-to-earth. He had enjoyed large support of his early career by the Democratic Party. But by the time he was elected to his second term as governor, his party began to lose patience with him. By the mid-1930s, the party began to divide into two factions, supporters of Tingley and those who supported another New Mexico Democratic politician, U.S. Senator Dennis Chavez. The two ambitious men were initially allies, supporting each other's campaigns in the 1920s. But as their power grew, they began to disagree. As governor, Tingley appointed Chavez to the U.S. Senate. But when Clyde Tingley tried to get a state constitutional amendment passed that would allow him to attempt to hold on to his position as governor of New Mexico indefinitely, Chavez vehemently opposed Tingley. Tingley's amendment failed, and he had to give up hopes of holding the position of governor past his two elected terms. The two men fought for dominance of the New Mexican Democratic Party. Their hostility spilled over, affecting other politicians. John Miles, a fellow Democrat, was Clyde Tingley's successor to the position of governor. But when he attempted to move into the governor's mansion in Santa Fe, he couldn't find the keys. Miles was an ally of Chavez, and Tingley chose to take the keys back to Albuquerque rather than hand them over to Miles. So Miles was forced to break into the governor's mansion through a window to get into his new home. Tingley could hold a grudge. But he returned to Albuquerque and once again ran for a seat on the city commission. He won easily, but times were changing. The post-war years brought growth and industry that Tingley could not control. His power and political influence significantly waned. He disagreed with the new voices in town, he didn't like the ways in which Albuquerque was growing, and he would shout down officials in public meetings. He and Carrie had spent decades tending to Albuquerque like doting parents, but their child was no longer listening to them. Clyde grew cantankerous. Never an easy man to work with, he now was impossible. The man whose name was etched on landmarks all around the city was now a barrier to progress in Albuquerque. Clyde left the city commission in 1953, retiring to serve on civic boards around the city. On Christmas Eve of 1960, Clyde Tingley died. Carrie died less than a year later. The Tingley legacy remained strong in Albuquerque, not only with Tingley Beach, Tingley Drive, and Tingley Coliseum still on the map, but Clyde's desk from his days as chairman of the city commission is on display in City Hall. And the Tingley's home on Silver Avenue, where they lived after their stay at the governor's mansion, is on the National Register of Historic Places to honor the couple from Ohio who adopted Albuquerque as their own and greatly influenced its growth in the 20th century. Thank you for joining us for Picture This with the Albuquerque Museum. Please join us next time for the story behind another photograph in the museum's collection.